this is Ampula and welcome to another episode of Face to Face. I'm Tenzin, your host. Today I am joined by the first woman satellite engineer in the country. Welcome to Face to Face Lab. Thank you. Uh, can you please go ahead with a little introduction? Uh, hello everyone, my name is Ishi Chodin and I work as a space engineer slash satellite engineer with the GovTech agency. Basically, uh, some of my responsibilities are to develop satellites, process the data that we get from the mm -hmm. satellites, and turn them into valuable services for the use of everyone. And most importantly, one of my uh, interests and work areas is also promoting about science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, uh, especially to the young people in this country mm -hmm. so that uh, we have more of them interested in science and technology. Okay, uh, since uh, engineering is a male-dominated uh, profession globally, however, in Bhutan, you uh, helped break that stereotype notion. So how do you feel about being the first uh, satellite engineer in the country? So, at first glance, it doesn't feel really different because when I first uh, chose to be in this field, there was no such barrier about being a man or a woman. So the opportunity was open for all. But I feel so proud and happy that I took this step mm -hmm. because I could have been one of those women who didn't come forward to take the opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I feel grateful and I feel happy with myself mm -hmm. that I decided to embark on this journey and take the risks uh, of being the first person and I'm very happy to be here at the moment. <laughs> so was uh, becoming an engineer what you always wanted to be? Was that your aspiration as a child? Yes, I think I wanted to be in a dynamic work environment. So usually when we grow up, we think of our work as a lifelong kind of a profession. So if you're a doctor, you're a doctor for life. You become more and more of a doctor mm -hmm. day by day or year by year. Or if you're a teacher, you serve as a teacher for the rest of your life. But for me, I always envisioned my career to be a dynamic one. And I that is also coming from my um, innate nature of being curious and adventurous. So I always look forward to new opportunities and experiences. Mm -hmm. And because of this nature of me, I have first trained myself as a civil engineer in undergraduate. Then I went on to become a public health engineer. And finally, I embarked on to the journey of being a space engineer. And I think my journey is not, it has not come to an end yet, so I'm really excited about where I'm going next. So being the first, first is very hard, it's very difficult. So you being the first satellite engineer in the country, what are the challenges that you faced and you are still facing? I look at it from both ways, mm -hmm. in the sense that it is difficult and it is challenging, at the same time, the same amount of challenge and the same amount of difficulty makes your effort worthwhile. So the impact that you can create being the first person is 100 times bigger than being the second person, although they are very close in nature. And that's the, the main reason why that is because uh, when you choose to become the first, more than the technical and the logistics uh, challenges mm -hmm. of being in this kind of job, you are breaking barriers, you're breaking um, ideas, you're breaking through concepts. Kind of imagine it like uh, an, an invisible or transparent membrane or a bubble that you're living in, you know? Mm -hmm. So when you choose to become the first person, you have the responsibility as well as the opportunity to break through that membrane and open the world to a whole new different um, realm of opportunities. So yes, it was challenging, but at the same time, very exciting. Mm -hmm. And when I look back at, you know, when I first started in this journey, um, I think I had a lot of faith and hope in what could be the possibilities instead of what, what could be the challenges and the negativities. 
So that really helped to, you know, change my perspective of looking at challenges in this field. So apart from your profession, you are also empowering women through STEM, right? So what do, you, do you have anything to say about that? So we have this group called mm -hmm. the Women in STEM Bhutan Group, which is really a voluntary initiative stemming very close from my own personal experience of being the first uh, female space engineer in the country. And through a shared um, interest among similar women who, who are... Um, you know, represented by very few in their own fields. Mm -hmm. So it's not only me, but across various sectors, like in the academia, in the science fields, in the hospitals, in the ICT world, in engineering, of course. So everywhere, the representation of women is very less. Mm -hmm. So all of us, we came together and we said that we this is an issue and it is upon us to do something about it. So that's why we started this group called the Women in STEM Bhutan <coughs> Group. And our objective is to promote women and girls who are already in this field and at the same time empower those who are not yet here to to embark on this wonderful journey about, uh, you know, um, contributing towards the world's development through science and technology. Okay. So apart from your profession and STEM, do you have other dreams that you are yet to fulfill? Uh, I have a, a few of them mm -hmm. actually. So another thing that I've also been doing is I have a love for languages mm -hmm. and literature. So I've also published my first book, which is a collection of poetry on love um, last year. And this year, I've published another book called uh, Ramela the Last Star, which is a children's book, mm -hmm. and it will be in market very soon, mm -hmm. uh, actually just within one week. So we'll be very, eager to read yes, <laughs> very excited for that. Mm -hmm. And then when I was studying in high school, I was fortunate somehow um, when I was dancing for my house a dance competition in the school. Uh, my teacher, who is a cultural expert, Libikar Mohandi from YHS, he spotted me and he asked me to be part of the school cultural group. Mm -hmm. And then in the following year, I became the school cultural captain. And my association with our cultural dance and mm -hmm. music grew more and more because of that. And now, even after I've started working, um, we have come together, all the ex-students of Levi Karmawandi, and we have formed this group called Karmai Loktu. Mm -hmm. So our main objective is to appreciate and still enjoy and embrace the beautiful dance and musical culture, mm -hmm. traditional mm -hmm. musical culture of Bhutan. So we have also done a couple of projects and every once in a while we go on TV or make mm -hmm. a music video and mm -hmm. so on. So these are also some of my other interests. And, uh, yeah, let me stop there. <laughs> right. Let's take one project at a time. <laughs> okay. Uh, talking about technology, do you think uh, technology has a promising future? It's, it's not a question about whether technology has a promising future or not. It is going to be the future. Mm -hmm. So the question really that we should ask ourselves is, where do you see yourself? And where do we see ourselves as a country? Mm -hmm in that kind of a future because it's not a future that only Bhutan is creating or one person is creating. It is something that is happening at the global mm -hmm. scale. The whole world is moving towards technology and industrial revolution 4.0. Mm -hmm. So it's really up to us whether we want to be a part of the revolution or we want to be out of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do you have any upcoming projects that you're working on? As of now? Uh, so my main focus at the moment is my job at the mm -hmm. space um, division and also with the women in STEM. So with the women in STEM, I think uh, when you look at statistics, at a global scale, UNESCO published this report saying that the enrollment of girls or women in STEM is less than 10% mm -hmm. internationally. So 
yes, in Bhutan, we definitely have to work towards that and make that uh, problem go away. But even at the global scale, this is a global problem. Mm -hmm. And I'm really looking forward to addressing this global issue, not only in Bhutan, but all across the world, so that, let's say, women... Uh, amount to about 50% of the world's population. That's just a rough estimate, just for the sake of this conversation. So we have about 8 billion people in the world, which means four of them, 4 billion people are women. And to do something to impact 4 billion people in this world, I think is a very huge and exciting project. So I'm really looking forward to work more towards that. So considering your profession to be very specialized with the size of the scope in the country, how do you uh, see yourself and uh, ease of working? So in terms of uh, professionally uh, developing the in this field, it is very challenging because uh, we have to rely on... So usually, even in technology, the knowledge transfer happens from those who have experienced more. And then it becomes easier for the younger professionals. So in Bhutan, uh, us being the first uh, few or the pioneers in this field, we always have to... Uh, make an extra effort to learn about things and in that respect it was really useful that we started off this uh, space program as a joint multi-nations project in Japan because now we are part of a network of satellite engineers, mm -hmm. professors, so they kind of, our alumni network helps us to learn more about mm -hmm. the new developments in this field. And at the same time, uh, international cooperation is very important. So for our second project as well, we partnered with the government of India. And similarly in the future as well, we hope to partner with uh, many agencies across the world so that we not only um, share our experiences, but also learn from the other expertise in different agencies across the world. So since you're in this field, how do you think the country can, uh, how do you see that country can leverage and have potential for its expansion? So especially when it comes to the space technology, there is a huge potential. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the space industry as of now, it has also entered a new age called the new space mm -hmm. age where things are quite different from how it used to work. So in the traditional space age, it was only the very big and powerful countries mm -hmm. uh, because space was a huge investment um, sector. It, it used to cost, one satellite used to cost millions and millions of dollars. Uh, so it was practically impossible for small and medium-sized players mm -hmm. to enter this field. However, in the new space age, there are many private companies as well as smaller countries, medium-sized countries, uh, developing countries who are now members of the international space community. And similarly, a lot of other private companies, mm -hmm. big and small private companies. So in that respect, I think we have a lot of room and opportunity for development mm -hmm. and we have entered a space at the right age. So uh, what do you think is the country's status in the field of satellite and are we on the right track? So as of now, we have launched two satellites mm -hmm. and we've been receiving data from them and we are expecting to work on more projects. We started in 2016 from ground zero. Basically, we had nothing, no space engineers, no human mm. resource, no infrastructure. As of now, we have quite a bit of people working in it and we are actively working to expand the space uh, industry and we are exploring many new opportunities. So I hope that we are on the right track and I believe we are on the right track and we hope to be able to go to new heights with the space mm. program. So, would you recommend young Bhutanese to take up this profession? Definitely, mm. it's one of the industries at the moment, especially uh, if you look at all the services that we use 
be it from weather forecasting to precision agriculture to mobile communications, mm. t- television broadcasting, all these technologies are actually originating from satellites that are orbiting the Earth at the moment mm-hmm. as you're speaking. So to realize the impact of this technology on our lives and to do something about it would be a good opportunity mm-hmm. and something that Bhutan has not done for the longest time. Mm-hmm. But finally, because of His Majesty the King's vision, we have uh, give, we have the gift of space mm-hmm. now. So I would really encourage everyone to explore and find an opportunity for okay. yourself mm-hmm. in this literally very very big industry Mm -hmm. it's beyond the sky so there are no um, shortage of opportunities Mm -hmm. all right so now that we came to an end of our conversation do you have any advice or message that you want to pass on to the viewers who are watching us right now so uh, my message is really um, nothing extraordinary but at the same time something that is very small and valuable The thing is, in Bhutan, we have gender equality in the sense that there is no rule or um, regulation that is suppressing the participation of women and representation of women across all fields, whether it's in politics or leadership or science or education. Everywhere, women are given equal opportunities. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, we have gender equality. But at the same time, for example, if a college admission opens, and if it is a science and technology related course, the admission rules does not tell you that since you're a woman, you cannot apply. So it's open for all and there's uh, gender equality. But at the same time, when you look at the number of enrollments, Mm -hmm. women are far lesser. So the question is, why are women not coming forward? Mm -hmm. Even when there are opportunities. Is it something that your parents told you? Or were you influenced by something else? So there is a very complex situation going on, which is resulting to this kind of uh, thing. So at this point in time, since we don't know all the factors that are affecting it, I would like to encourage every woman and girl out there that no matter what circumstance you choose, you're always going to face challenges and there will always be a set of risks. It's not like if you don't choose the science course or if you choose it, it's, your life is going to be more difficult. And if you choose the arts course, your di- life is going to be less difficult. You'll always have your own set of problems based on your own choices. So I would like to encourage everyone to be brave. And even if there are going to be challenges and risk, mm-hmm. you should still continue to make the choices that interest you. Because at the end of the day, these are the opportunities, these are the chances that you take that is going to make your life worthwhile Mm -hmm. instead of choosing the easier way out. So I want every woman and girl out there to be brave and courageous in choosing a life of your own. Thank you so much. Thank Thank you so much for coming to the show and for the advice as well. That was a really beautiful chat with you. Thank Thank you so much again. Thank you. And with this, we came to an end of this conversation. Please don't forget to like, share and follow our page. Take care and see you all again.